Hello ladies, welcome to our chapter 6 video lecture on the transfiguration. You can find it in your textbooks on pages 114 through 117. And you can also read it in the Gospel of Mark. It's Mark 9, 2 through 8. And I'm going to read it for you right now so you have it in your mind as we uh, study it in greater detail. So in Mark 9 it reads, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up on a high mountain apart from themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no fuller on earth could bleach them. Then Elijah appeared to them along with Moses, and they were conversing with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus in reply, Rabbi, it's good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He hardly knew what to say. They were so terrified. Then a cloud came, casting a shadow over them. And from the cloud came a voice, saying, This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone but Jesus along with them. Alone with them. So, as you can see, the story of the Transfiguration is relatively brief, um, but it is packed with symbolic meaning. So, uh, using the uh, scripture interpretation method we learned last year, let's begin with the literal level which is just the summary of the story. You now know the story of Jesus being transformed on the mountain and looking at what's the context, who was there, just the basic surface level stuff. So let's start off with some vocabulary. First of all, we have the word transfiguration. What does transfiguration mean? It says he's transfigured. It basically means he changed in appearance. And um, in this case, he, he uh, changed... Um, his clothes became dazzling white. He's there with Elijah and Moses. A cloud comes. So Jesus' appearance changes, um, and this is symbolic of his true identity. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about what this means uh, on the next slide. So when does this happen? The time this event takes place is highly symbolic. Uh, in the Synoptic Gospels, there are two main phases to, to the, what, the action in the Gospels. The first is Jesus' mission to proclaim the kingdom of God. So up to this point in the Gospels, Jesus is going about performing miracles, preaching, and telling people about the kingdom of God. Now, the transfiguration happens at this critical in-between time where the, the purpose and phase of his mission is going to change. He is going to now go into the second part of his mission, which is to bring about redemption for sin. And so Jesus is transfigured at this turning point. This is a critical point where his preaching mission has ended, and now he's going to go into the final phase of his mission, which is to bring redemption from sin through his death, resurrection, and ascension. So this is the turning point. It has, the next thing that's going to happen in the Gospels is he's going to go into Jerusalem, and it happens at the final week of his life. So the transfiguration is, is this symbolic turning point in the narrative where we switch from talking about the mission of the kingdom of God and going into the Paschal mystery. And um, we'll talk about why is this event, you know, the transmission point in just a second. So this also happens at a symbolic location. It's on Mount Tabor. And um, the, this mountain is um, also known uh, as Mount Sinai, where uh, Moses got the Ten Commandments, where Moses saw God and where Elijah was, um, also heard the voice of God in the sound of silence. So the, the, the fact that this is happening here is highly symbolic. Um, who's there? Of course, we have Jesus. We have um, James, John, and Peter. And these guys, why these three? Because these are um, Jesus' uh, inner circle of the disciples, of the apostles there, the inner circle, the most trusted. And, of course, you have Elijah and Moses there also present in appearance with Jesus. And we'll talk about why those two guys in just a second. And, and finally, this is what we call another vocabulary word. It's a theopan. It's, um, it's an appearance of God. Uh, this is a fancy word we use in religion to show that God um, is present. And so he is appearing here um, with Jesus in the form of his voice but also Jesus reveals his divine identity through his transfiguration. So let's talk a little bit more about that and all the symbols that are in this story. Now, this was a short story. It was only a few verses long, but almost every single word is packed with symbolic meaning. 
Um, when we talk about the allegorical level of scripture, that's the hidden message. Uh, in the Old Testament, as Christians, we're often looking for allegories for Christ. Where is Christ revealed in this? What's fascinating about this story is you have uh, a Christian story having all these beautiful allegories for things that happened in the Old Testament in connection to the Old Testament. So, first of all, it says that he, after the six days, he went up to he went up on the mountain. Those the six days is significant. Um, Moses also went up on the mountain to meet God after spending um, six days uh, in prayer. And so, and that happens in Exodus. So that he goes up after six days and not three or five or seven um, is symbolic at, to remind us of Moses meeting God in Exodus. The high mountain. In salvation history, in the Old Testament, even in the ancient Near Eastern religions, mountains were where God lived. People thought, you know, the closer you got to the sky, the closer you got to God. So mountains are significant. This mountain, in particular, Mount Tabor, is where mo both Moses and Elijah had encounters with God um, on this same mountain. So it, it, the fact that he goes up on a mountain is highly significant in connecting us. Well, something's going to happen with God here. Now the dazzling white clothes. It says Jesus was transfigured and his clothes became dazzling white. So in ancient Israel, the white clothes were um, symbolic. Light, um, anything associated with light or um, uh, things that were white, um, that was symbolic of the presence of God. Uh, when Moses meets the, uh, God on the mountain, there's lightning, there's a bright light. So this is symbolic of the presence of God. So that Jesus is taking on this light, and Jesus has this light that seems to emanate from him, shows us his real identity. This is God. This isn't just a man. Um, also, in you know, we talk about Jesus, God is, you know, Jesus is light from light, God from God. So it, even in our creed, you know, we associate God with light too. Um, in the early church, uh, also the white robes uh, were a symbol of martyrdom, and T uh, or Y R were symbolic of martyrdom. And Jesus is this is leading up to the week where Jesus will essentially become a martyr for all of our sins. He is sometimes called in, in the church writings the martyr of martyrs. So by taking on the white robe, he's showing his divine identity. He's transformed from, they're seeing him reveal not just his human side, but his um, divine side. And we're seeing him taking on the identity as a martyr, um, the martyr for all of our sins. So the dazzling white robe is symbolic both of his divini divinity and also of his martyrdom, which really shows us kind of his mortality and, his, and shows us that human aspect of, of the person that Jesus is. So going on to the next slide, we have <clears throat> the cloud. Just, just like with light in um, ancient Israel, uh, in, in this, this, uh, this literature, in this culture, the clouds also represent God. So the cloud overshadows him. It can also represent the Holy Spirit. Often in um, in is in in uh, the uh, Jewish religion, the cloud would represent the spirit of God, um, that part of God that dwells with them. So that the cloud comes down, and then you hear the voice, "This is my beloved son. Listen to him." And of course, this echoes the baptism. So at the very beginning of Jesus's mission, we saw God saying, "You know, this is my beloved son, with whom I'm well pleased." Now He says, "This is my beloved son. Listen to him." So this sort of bookends the mission of Jesus. It started with the baptism. Now the voice of God comes again, and we're starting the second phase of the mission. So um, by including this, you know, the voice of God here, we see not only sort of the, the again the Holy Trinity present in um, symbolic form here with the clouds and the voice and Jesus. We see. Um, them sort of bookending and bringing it all together from the beginning of the mission now to the second phase of the mission. They're closing out the mission about the kingdom of God and they're opening up the second phase, the mission of redemption. So it's really beautiful. And again, remember the two people who were there with Jesus. We had Moses and Elijah, also highly symbolic figures. Remember, Moses was the greatest prophet of Israel. He represents the law and the giving of the first covenant. And Elijah represents the prophet and the fight for social justice. And so um, Elijah also, your book doesn't mention this incidentally, but Elijah is also a, a, a 
closely associated with the coming of the Messiah. Uh, in the um, Jewish religion of the time, they thought that uh, Elijah would be like a harbinger or a um, sort of a sign that the Messiah was here, that Elijah would return first and then the Messiah would come. So having Moses and Elijah shows that Jesus is the fulfillment of both the law and the prophet. He's going to bring the second covenant, which is represented by Moses, and he's going to fulfill all the words of the prophet, which is represented by Elijah. So that these two men are um, there with Jesus represents that he's both the fulfillment of the covenant, that he is here to bring social justice. It also gives him authority. Any Jew reading the story would have said, whoa, he was with Elijah and Moses? Um, that would have been giving him total street cred among the Jews at the time. So that all this you know, symbolism is here, and it kind of tells us a lot about who Jesus is. So it's revealing Jesus' true identity. Um, you know, very shortly after that, Peter is going to declare Jesus the Son of Man, and that's symbolic of Jesus as the Messiah. This term, Son of Man, it literally, in Hebrew, it's bar the nosh. Um, I'm not sure if I spelled that right, but it just means Son of Man or a human being. But in a lot of the prophetic books, like Ezekiel and Daniel, it got associated with the Messiah. And so Jesus here has revealed his true identity. He's revealed himself as, um, as the divine son of God. Uh, and he's revealed himself as uh, the redeemer. This is the cause of the fact that he's going to go on to um, a mission of redemption. So by revealing, um, transfiguring himself, he's revealed he's not just a human being. He's not just a prophet. He's the son of God. And he's also revealing the new phase of his mission. By appearing in the white clothes and showing himself as a martyr, he's saying, look, I'm not here just to, to proclaim the kingdom of God. I'm here to do what needs to be done to inaugurate an earth. And part of that um, is redeeming us from sin. It also is a preview of what is to come. It, it is a preview of Jesus' glorious resurrection. By appearing as the glorious Son of God in these beautiful white robes with the two great prophets of Israel, he's, a, he's showing us um, what it's going to look like for the resurrection. He's, he's revealing the resurrection and the ascension to us. By appearing with Elijah and Moses, he's showing that he is going to be with these um, two great prophets with God together after the ascension. It's sort of a preview of what's to come. But not just for Jesus. It's not just showing Jesus as the martyr, as the redeemer, as the one who's going to have victory over death. For us, it shows us that we will also have a transfiguration. That through Christ's martyrdom, we too will be transformed. Your book has a lovely quote. It says, the transvi transfiguration is a preview of the resurrection, life and death, of, and of Jesus' second coming again in glory, when the reign of God will come about. This transfiguration gives us a foretaste of Christ's glorious coming, when he will change our lowly body to be like his glorious body. And that last quote is actually from the Catechism, number 556. Five, so the transfiguration here is not just telling us something about um, Jesus, it's telling us something about what we will be transfigured like. A lot of us wonder, hey, what is it going to be like when Christ comes again? What is it going to be like when we go through the bodily resurrection? According to the Catechism, this gives us a taste. We are going to have a transformation, too, just like Jesus. So it works also on, not just on an allegory about Jesus' true nature, but on that anagogical, eternal level, telling us not just about this life here, but about our eternal life, God, heaven. So all that being said, there's a lot in there. Um, I want you to kind of think to yourself of three ideas, three concepts, three new things you learned from this lecture that better help you understand Jesus. Um, after reading the, the, the treatment of the Transfiguration in your textbook, I had never really thought about how the Transfiguration really reveals to us um, Jesus' mission as the, the martyr and redeemer. I'd always looked at the, sort of the, the aspect of showing Jesus as God. Um, I was always fascinated by the idea of him, of him glowing and having these dazzling white clothes. But knowing now that this reveals his identity um, as, as the true Son of God, but also showing what the resurrection will be like, showing what the second coming will be like. I was really impressed by that. That was a, that was a level of meaning in the story I'd never even noticed before. 
And I thought, wow, that's really cool. This is this is a story thick with meaning. And I thought, wow, I, I really, I understand, you know, Jesus a little bit better now because he's always been revealing to me a, a message that I didn't even know before. And the scriptures are always revealing something that I had never known before, even though I've been studying scriptures, you know, studying religion for over 13 years now. I was really impressed by that. So think of some things you learned that you were impressed with. And um, in class, we're going to do an activity to try to personally connect with this story on a heart level. Um, try to connect to how it relates to our life and our faith. You got an academic treatment here, but today in class, um, having all this in the back of your head, we're going to do an activity where we're going to try to more personally connect with the story. So I hope you enjoyed the lecture. I know it had a lot of information, um, but it was just too, too good an analysis to pass up. So um, thank you and be ready to uh, connect deeper with the story in class.